What is Thank your um, sure? What is your uh, analysis of the military conflict between uh, the Israeli Defense Forces uh, and Hamas as it, as it stands today, uh, two and a half weeks after the uh, October seventh Hamas attack? Well, first and foremost, we have to understand that Israel suffered a um, a major humiliation on October seventh, and. It was demoralizing to the Israeli Defense Force. And uh, the, the Gaza operation, um, in a large part, is an act of revenge uh, on the part of Israel uh, for the Israeli Defense Force to be seen as, um, you know, resetting the, uh, the, the, the status quo uh, to, to once again have the Israelis as the dominant military force. But war is an extension of politics by other means, and things aren't going well for Israel on the political front. They're losing much of the world. Uh, people are starting to line up with not just Palestine, but with Hamas. And, um, you know, the, this this conflict in Gaza has had to be scaled down as part of a escalation management because Israel can't afford to go in too hard, too hot, too heavy, um, less Hezbollah intervene from the north. And Israel's not ready for that. Uh, Israel is, you know, has its hands full in Gaza. If Hezbollah comes in from the north, there's nothing Israel can do to stop that unless it invites American, uh, you know, America to join in on the suppression of Hezbollah. And then Iran comes into the mix. Now we have a regional war that can become a world war. So Israel has to proceed slowly. Um, They're doing that. Uh, There's been no decisive engagement between Israel and Hamas. There's been some skirmishing. Uh, Both sides are avoiding uh, that that kind of final confrontation. I think Hamas is waiting for Israel to stumble into a trap that can be executed properly. And Israel doesn't want to get too far ahead of itself, lest it stumble into a trap that Hamas can execute effectively. So it's a very slow go right now operation. Earlier uh, today, um, actually just a few minutes before we uh, began this interview, uh, there were reports of the Israeli uh, Defense Forces having attacked uh, a Palestinian refugee camp in which hundreds of innocents were killed, and the Israelis acknowledged it was their attack. They said they were after a Hamas leader. They claimed they killed the Hamas leader, and they somehow argue Uh, that all the innocents were collateral damage and that this is lawful under international war. You and I know this is not lawful at all under uh, international law. But why would the Israelis make such a statement like that for which there is no moral or legal grounding whatsoever? Do they really believe it? Well, Israel does believe that it's above the law. It's it's behaved uh, above the law for so many years. There's been nobody holding Israel to account ever for the... Uh, numerous war crimes they've committed over the years, especially against the Palestinians. Uh, The United States won't allow uh, any sense of accountability uh, from the international community, especially in the United Nations. We veto every Security Council resolution that goes forward to criticize Israel or call out the crimes of Israel. Um, You know, this one is different uh, because, as I said, the world has turned. Uh, There's right now uh, the international community is aligning itself with the people of Palestine. And Israel just struck a, a refugee camp, a major refugee camp, well known to everybody. There's no doubt what this place is. Humanity is packed into this. Six large bombs dropped in to kill one man. It doesn't work that way, Israel. And Israel knows that. Uh, you know, there's this term of distinction. Israel has to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that they've made positive identification of that. The U.S. standard is D. Um, you know, we need to have the body. This is the standard we'd use for Osama bin Laden. One of the reasons why SEAL Team 6 went in to kill him so that we could confirm that his body was there as opposed to dropping a bomb on it. Then there's the whole issue of proportionality. Uh, collateral damage is the damage done to civilian life proportional to the military advantage that was gained by this. And if Israel's trying to make the case that one Hamas guy uh, is the difference between victory and defeat, therefore worthy of the deaths of we don't know how many Palestinians, good luck making that case. What was Hamas's goal on uh, October 7th, Scott? We need to understand that um, Israel was in control of the um, 
of, of the Palestinian processes. And Israel had, through the Abrams Accord, which the Trump administration put in motion in 2019, it pretty much guaranteed there would never be a Palestinian state. Uh, they were on the verge of uh, normalizing relations with Saudi Arabia that would bring in the Gulf Arab nations, and all hopes of a Palestinian state were, were done. So first and foremost, Hamas put the issue of a Palestinian state back on the table. That was goal number one. Goal number two was the prisoners. Palestine, the, the Hamas has thousands of prisoners held in pr- Israeli jails without any due process. They are just imprisoned forever. They'll never be released. They're being tortured, murdered, beat up. And they said, we want these guys released. So one of the goals was to go in, take hostages, bring them back and get an exchange in place. Three was to make the point about the Al-Aqsa Mosque. It's being desecrated by, it's the third most holy Islamic shrine in the world site. Um, and it's in Jerusalem, uh, and the Israelis have been desecrating the Al-Aqsa Mosque, uh, beating up worshipers, pushing women around. It's horrific what they're doing. Nobody would tolerate this at, uh, at the Vatican. Nobody would tolerate this you know, at a major Jewish synagogue. It shouldn't be tolerated, the Al-Aqsa Mosque. But Israel, again, does this and gets away with it. Nobody calls them out except Hamas. So Hamas has gone forward. They have changed the paradigm of how people view Palestine and Israel. We are having discussions today that no Nobody was having this time last month about a two-state solution, the viability of a Palestinian state. That's on the table, and it's not going away. With whom are we having these discussions? Is the United States uh, discussing with Benjamin Netanyahu a two-state solution? No, we're having the discussion with ourselves right now. I mean, it's it, it, it got to start someplace, Judge. Right, um, right, right. Okay. But you know, when when Joe Biden, who is you know an, uh, you know been an ardent supporter of Israel for some time now, um, says that there will be no return to the status quo of October sixth, meaning that the Abrams Accord, uh, the direction that Israel was heading with settlements, etc., those days are done that there will have to be a discussion about a two-state solution. Saudi Arabia said the same thing. There will be no normalization of relationships between Israel and Saudi Arabia until there's a Palestinian state. The whole world is saying that. Israel's been boxed into a corner. uh, The the world seems to be outraged at the nature and extent of Israeli bombing of Gaza. But militarily speaking... How successful or unsuccessful has uh, the Israeli military been in the past three weeks? You know, it's difficult to know unless I had had, had access to their target list and understood the uh, the intelligence that went into that. I, I helped build target lists of this nature, so I know um, you know it, it's an exacting task to define the target, to link it with intelligence that you know, helps define the target properly from a from a targeting standpoint, a prioritization standpoint. Israel was taken by surprise on October 7th. They had totally misread Hamas. So how, having gotten it all wrong on October, prior to October 7th, now today we're to believe that suddenly they have perfect intelligence, perfect targeting. What's happening here is what happened to us during the Gulf War when we were trying to kill Iraqi scuds. The Iraqis were firing scuds into Israel. It was embarrassing us. So we we put thousands of aircraft into the airspace over Western Iraq. We put commandos on the ground and we said, start attacking something, but we didn't have a target list. So we attacked everything. That's what Israel's doing right now in Gaza. They don't have good intelligence. If they did, they wouldn't have been outsmarted on the seventh. They're literally right now bombing everything, anything. Somebody comes up and says, I think there could be something down here. They're putting a bomb on it. And what does that uh, accomplish other than, destruction of infrastructure, driving Hamas underground, and Arab rage, rage in the reason in the region. Well, Hamas was already underground. Hamas has been building a tunnel network, 500 kilometers of tunnels um, in, in, the, in, a, in a very you know, small area. Uh, some of these tunnels are 70 meters underground, 210 feet. Um, you know, the, the, the bombs that were dropping can penetrate, you know, 40, 50, 60 meters. So many of these tunnels can't be hit by by the bombs that they're dropping above ground. Um, this is a feel good operation uh, there. You know, Hamas leadership aren't above ground. They're not hanging out in these buildings that Israel's dropping. This is punishment, collective punishment, uh, putting a, a sending a message to the Palestinian people that never again will they be allowed to 
uh, allow, you know, facilitate Hamas and a Hamas attack of this nature. That's a war crime, by the way. Collective punishment is a war crime. But the other thing that Israel is doing is, again, you look at history. Um, when the Germans bombed Stalingrad into oblivion, the, it became impossible to take because now the Soviet defenders just dug into the rubble. When we bombed uh, Monte Cassino in in, uh, in Italy um, and, and collapsed that, the German paratroopers just went into the ground. Uh, in Iwo Jima, the Japanese were underground. It took us a lot of time to take Japan. Some of those guys hid out until you know 1949. Now you combine blowing the buildings up with a tunnel network that you can't access, you're making a very difficult problem almost impossible. So from a military standpoint, what Israel's doing is the exact last thing you want to be doing. You're making an impossible battlefield for the troops that have to go in and root out Hamas. Does uh, the Israeli leadership think that they can defeat Hamas? I think we have to be careful with their rhetoric right now because the Israeli leadership has to Remember, Benjamin Netanyahu was already in crisis mode prior to October 7th. He had rewritten basic law. He was doing away with an independent judiciary. Hundreds of thousands of Israelis were in the street crawling for his resignation. Uh, The president of Israel was talking about the potential of a civil war, shooting war between Israelis, a real possibility. And now October 7th, humiliation comes in. It's his failure. He's the security prime minister. And the worst day in Israeli history took place under his watch. So they're baying for his blood. He right now is desperately trying to hold off the ultimate accountability by saying things. Uh, You have to look confident. Remember, everybody who's talking about beating Hamas got beat by Hamas. Okay, this this these are the people, the generals, the politicians. They're the ones who got beat by Hamas. So now they have to be talking tough. But their rhetoric is literally boxing them into a corner. It's removing options that could be available to Israel to bring this conflict to an end. Again, I think I've mentioned it before. I'll say it again. The best way to, to, to terminate this is to stop bombing right now. Exchange the prisoners right now. No preconditions. Let the humanitarian good in right now and tell Hamas, join me at the table. We'll resolve this all face to face. Game set matches are right at that point. They won, but they won't do it. Netanyahu won't do it because he knows when the war is over, he's done. His premiership is over and his liberty may be over. So it's in his personal vested interest to drag this war on, no matter how bloody no matter how unlawful, no matter how genocidal it might be. Correct. But uh, for the moment, remember, he's, he's, he's not a dictator yet. And um, at some point in time, there's going to have to be a group of people to go to Benjamin Netanyahu and say, literally, you're done. You're finished. You're coming with us, uh, whether you want to be in handcuffs or not. But you're removed. We're stepping in. We have to look out for the greater interests of Israel to save Israel. Um, and those are the people that can make that decision. You're right. Benjamin Netanyahu is a thoroughly compromised leader of Israel. He is potentially the man that's going to be responsible for the destruction of Israel if the current events head their direction. If Hezbollah and Iran become involved in this conflict in a meaningful way, Israel loses hands down. It's all over for Israel. How significant are uh, Turkish President Erdogan's riling up of a million people uh, in a in a public square by calling Hamas uh, a liberation uh, organization? Well, I mean, Israel's always had had this. I mean, I'm sorry, Turkey's always had this stance. They viewed Hamas not as a terrorist group, but um, you know, a, a political element. And now they're calling them a liberation element. Um, what's significant about it is that uh, Turkey's setting a standard. It's a Muslim country. Um, it's appealing to the Muslim world, uh, the pan-Turkic world. And uh, this is a big deal. As I said, war is an extension of politics by other means. Israel's losing the political game. Turkey used to be a friend and ally of Israel. Uh, the Turkish military and the Israeli military used to work together. Uh, Turkey has bought a lot of Israeli equipment. Those days are over. Turkey's turned. Uh, they are now a, a de facto enemy of Israel. And that's a standard that's being set that the rest of the Muslim world uh, will will um, will fall in around. Does, does Israeli leadership believe that it can defeat all of its enemies? 
Well, no, they, they actually had two exercises, one last year, Cherry Sapphire, one this year, Firm Hand, where they tested that uh, in, a, in an exercise and they lost. Uh, they need American help. That's why you have American aircraft carriers coming in. That's why America sent RC, I mean, KC-135 aerial tankers that have gone to Israel and have been painted Israeli colors. We were giving them tankers so they can bomb Iran. Uh, they know that they can't do it by themselves. But the, the, the funny thing is, not the funny thing, but the real thing is, we know that even if we intervene on their behalf, half, we're not going to win. That's why the, the, the Biden administration is desperately pleading with Netanyahu not to escalate. And they thought they had it under control, but now they've dropped bombs on this refugee camp. And there's no telling what Nasrallah is going to do. He's the head of Hezbollah who gives a uh, sermon on Friday after prayers. That's sort of a big day. And he could literally declare war on Israel on Friday. And there's going to be a lot of uh, pressure on him to do so after the bombing of the uh, refugee camp. Just as you have uh, uh, stated on this show that the Ukrainian war could be over, the war Ukraine and Russia, in 24 hours if Joe Biden made a phone call, could Joe Biden make a similar phone call to Netanyahu or would Netanyahu tell him to take a hike? Uh, Netanyahu could say take a hike. We just turn off the money. End of it. I, I, we could do a number of things. We can tell them there's no more aid. We could make um, uh, APAC register as a foreign, uh, you know, as a foreign agent. Um, APAC is the American Israeli Public Affairs Committee that lobbies actively on the part of Israel government. Right now, they're treated as just a, um, a, 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 you know, civilian normal uh, lobby group. But if I was, if if APAC was the Russian. American political act and doing what they're doing, they'd be called foreign agents and they'd have to register as foreign agents. There's a lot of things we can do to shut Israel down. Um, you know, but we don't because there's Congress has been influenced by the Israeli lobby. I mean, Benjamin Netanyahu bragged about it. I'm not making this up. It's not anti-Semitic. He brags about the control he has of Congress. I control them. I bought them. I own them, he says. Come on now, America, when you have a foreign leader... <laughs> who says, I bought Congress, I own Congress, and now he's heading us down a path where we could get dragged into a world war. Isn't it time we sort of, you know, reflect on the nature of our relationship with that foreign leader in that country? Does the Israeli leadership believe that all men are created equal? If you're a political Zionist, you don't. If you're a political Zionist, you believe in a greater Israel and you believe in the covenant between God and the Israeli people uh, that guarantees them a homeland. Uh, you are the chosen people. And, um, and if, if you get too biblical, uh, you can go into the, 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 the Torah, the Talmud and others, and they use the term goyim. They use other terms that literally mean subhuman, less than you. And so you, you if you are a religious person, political Zionist, um, you believe you are the superior race and you believe that the Palestinians are subhumans. You believe American Christians are subhumans. I don't understand the connectivity between American Christians and, and Israel because literally, guys, they view you as subhuman. Okay, the, the guys you claim to be, we're not all Israelis. The mo mo majority of Israelis are secular. They, they don't buy into this nonsense. They just want to live in peace. But the political Zionists, the Benjamin Netanyahu's and the people he surrounded him, yeah, they are a superior race. They view everybody, the Palestinians, Americans, Russians, everybody as subhuman. We all know, or we think we know, what happened on October 7th in Israel. What happened on October 8th? <sighs> On October 8th, what happened is the um, the Israeli military started to react. They started late on the 7th, but on the 8th, they, they, they went in and they um, they launched a, a very vengeful counterattack. Um, uh, uh, Hamas was dug into a number of kibbutzes with a large number of uh, hostages. And the Israeli army just went in there and... Um, and, and, and I can't say indiscriminate because they did it on purpose. I mean, they put tank rounds into buildings where there were Jewish hostages held by Hamas because they they were going to kill Hamas. Um, the, I, Israeli, I, the Israeli military attacked Israelis in Israel because there were Hamas among them. Yes, I think they, they call it the Hannibal Doctrine. It's basically a doctrine that says that if an Israeli is taken hostage, that you kill them rather than allow them to be used as a tool in, um, 
in, 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 in negotiations down the road. But the Israeli military went in and um, look, Judge, they were humiliated. I mean, honest to God, what happened to the Israelis, uh, the Golani Brigade, one of their elite infantry brigades, had two battalions, the 13th and the 51st. They were on the Gaza line of contact. They weren't sleeping in their barracks. They weren't this. They were on duty and they got swamped. They got beat by Hamas in a stand up fight. Um, and, and that's a big deal. This is this is like in a Ranger battalion beat up or the 82nd Airborne beat up or the Marines getting beat up. You don't take that lightly. And Israel didn't take it lightly. And there's a lot of revenge uh, here. They were told to get the border secure. That was the political order down. Secure the border. You can't secure the border if Hamas is dug in on the kibbutz, which are part of the military belt around Gaza. So as long as they were there, they you, you had to get rid of them. They weren't going to turn this into a negotiation. They just went in and they killed everybody. There's a lady who gave an interview very very powerful interview. And she said there were 20 hostages, about eight Hamas fighters. And when it was done, there were eight dead Hamas fighters and 18 dead hostages. She and one other lady survived. Has Netanyahu acknowledged that his military killed Israelis on October 8th? Look, the, some of the Israeli press are trying to um, trying to talk about this. They're getting the stories out. Haaretz has run, run similar uh, things, um, you know, similar narratives of this nature. Uh, but no, it's something that's been actively suppressed. And not only that, but Israel is deliberately flipping the script and accusing Hamas of killing people. For instance, you've had Israeli colonels take people to uh, buildings that have been clearly hit by tank fire and saying, look what Hamas did. Hamas did this. Hamas did that. Now, indirectly, I guess you could say that it wouldn't have happened had Hamas not, not come across the border. But the munitions that destroyed that building and killed the Israelis inside were Israeli munitions. How do you see this ending, given uh, Netanyahu's need to continue a war and his um, indifference to innocent the, the, the suffering of innocent human life? Look, I want this to end peacefully. I want this to end um, in a way that doesn't escalate the conflict. I mean, but what I want and what I think is going to happen are two totally different things. I think Netanyahu is um, blinded by his uh, narcissism to stay in power, um, the hu humiliation that he suffered, the revenge that he's seeking. Uh, I think he's gone too far. We saw that with the uh, with the camp. I think Nasrallah and Hezbollah is under tremendous pressure. Look, if he doesn't go in and attack, uh, he loses all face. Hezbollah has been setting itself up as a defender of Palestinian rights. Um, Israel has never been weaker than they are today. There's never been more justification from a Hezbollah standpoint than there is today to use force. And if Nasrallah allows this moment to pass, which I pray he does because I don't want a greater war, but if he does that, he loses all credibility in the region. The same thing with Iran. I don't want Iran to be involved, but from an Iranian perspective, you will lose face. You you will never be able to talk about the Al-Aqsa Mosque again if you allow Israel to decimate the Palestinian people. So I'm afraid that on Friday, this thing can get real ugly, real fast. I hope I'm wrong. I want peace. I want a peaceful outcome. I don't want America to get dragged into this conflict. But um, things aren't looking good for peace right now. The American uh, neocons, uh, what pressure will they put on uh, old Joe? Look, you don't need to put pressure on Joe. Uh, Joe, you know, Joe has, you know, has has his policy. It's very pro-Israeli policy. Um, he won't make the phone call. And the neocons are even more rabid. I mean, if you take a look at some of these Republican candidates, Nikki Haley um, and uh, Vivek. I mean, guys talking about putting 100 Hamas heads on a pike. He's an American presidential candidate talking about putting heads on a pike. That's a disqualifier right there, ladies and gentlemen. You know, drunken Marines might be able to talk about that, but then they should be relieved because no law-abiding person, no human person talks about taking heads off, putting them on pikes anymore. He's a presidential candidate talking about Nikki Haley is just promoting war, promoting war, promoting war. If you're a parent with a child that's going to reach maturity sometime in the next year or two, don't vote for Nikki Haley because she's going to send your child off to war and die overseas where they don't need to die. The Republicans have discredited themselves. They're just, they're, they're insane right now. Who's talking peace? I mean, who is talking peace right now? No one. That's yeah, a sad the, thing. The, the libertarians are the only ones talking peace. The, the small government people, a lot of former military like you who know the horrors uh, of war, but the people who've never dirtied their, their hands or cut their uh, skin like Lindsey Graham and that crowd. 
They're, they want to start a war. Lindsey Graham's in favor of bombing Tehran, as if Tehran has something to do with this. Yeah, no, I mean, look, Lindsay, if you want to bomb the capital most responsible for this, there's two places you can bomb. One, you can bomb Washington, D.C., so bomb yourself, and then bomb Jerusalem, because that's the capital of Israel now, um, although Tel Aviv is the functioning capital. But, you know, that's where you need to look, Lindsay. Stop trying to export the, um, you know, the crimes that you've committed uh, and the blame for these crimes onto others at least man up and say, I've been promoting war for my entire life. I'm the one who created the policies that have put us in this situation. And uh, I want the American people to hold me accountable. But he won't do that. He keeps deflecting and blaming others for his sins. Scott, uh, you're, uh, you're a dynamo. Thank you so much for your uh, insight and your courageous and precise logical analysis of all of this. Well, thank you very much, Judge. Uh, it's such a pleasure to work with you. See you again soon, my friend. Thank you. More as we get it coming up later this week, uh, Colonel Doug McGregor, uh, Professor John Mearsheimer, Professor Jeffrey Sachs, Judge Napolitano for Judging Freedom. <laughs>